I'm just a boy from Kansas out to save the world from chronic disease. And I truly mean that. Nobody is in control of your health but you. I can't heal you. Your doctor can't heal you. You have to heal you. And it's all about having the education and empowerment to know what you need to be changing within yourself, within your life, to set your soul free and accomplish that best life that we all like to talk about. And I truly believe that the greatest mess in the ball is to teach people how not to need it. I'm Brendan Vermeyer, the original Holistic Savage. Welcome to the Holistic Savage Podcast. Well, hello. Well, hello. Just give me one second, Brendan. Let me shut down my dinging email. Make sure I'm center. Here I am. Whew. How are you? I'm amazing. How are you? I'm great. You can't say, but I do have oh, all stuck and tethered. I know. Yeah, Ooh, all right, twinsies. Yeah, I made a note last night. I was like, oh, shoot. I hope it's clean. It was. So, so <laughs> I know. Jackpot. <laughs> That's why I have like three of them. So I'm just like, oh, just, you know, it's my only wardrobe. It's fine. I luckily just did laundry over the weekend. So I was pretty secure that it was clean. Although I had to look down because I have another shirt that looks similar and in block lettering it says good vibes. So I was like, oh, and I had that on yesterday. So I was like, this isn't, okay, no, that's not. <laughs> we good, we good. Yeah. I am so excited for what's about to go down. Are you feeling this right now? Me too. I'm feeling lots of things. It's been a feeling type of week over here for me. <laughs> I bet. I bet I, I I should like preface this, you know, with like I'm coming off like the the biggest, most significant weekend of my career. And I'm just like, I don't know where I am and I fly out early tomorrow, but I've literally been so looking forward to this conversation like all year. Yeah, me too. Me too. I cool. remember we had our fall start and I know you were having a big weekend. I was having a big weekend. I'm finally getting some more grounding. So I'm happy it's Wednesday of this weekend, not Monday. Or (laughs) or else I would not have known where I was in a very real way. Oh, totally. Well, and you've been all over too. I saw you were in LA at one point and then somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, lots of traveling. The membership got launched on Friday. So lots of logistical things happening. Totally. Yeah, all I've, positive, all a, a million questions, you know, and that's where I, I envision at some point we'll be hanging out in person and we can, you know, talk all the behind the scenes stuff, but um, whew, okay, podcast stuff. So we're actually already recording, which is fun because I always like to just capture any juicy, you know, funny pre stuff, but um, we'll edit and uh, we'll, we'll get all the info to you and, and whatnot, but are you ready? We'll just dive in with them. Are you, you're hearing in me every in every way. Yeah. That's good. Okay, cool. Yeah, sound good. You got the professional mic and the I got like, the professional mic. I'm finding my, my way through using it as effectively as possible with the help sometimes of some of my uh, followers. <laughs> They're like, actually, if you turn it, it'd be all like, I'm all ears because technology is not my number one. Uh, that's that's exactly where I'm at. I'm like, send help. Don't know what so, I'm doing. So I have it, but that's very loose. So the user manual on it is still a work in progress. Oh, totally. And yeah, this it's <laughs> fine. Who? Okay. So let's just dive in. So essentially, you know, this holistic savage podcast is all about functional medicine, functional fitness, functional spirituality, and functional psychology, which you know, I really just kind of threw a functional in front of psychology and spirituality and now it's a thing. There you go. Um, and it's amazing. So, you know, I've been uh, really enjoying, you know, I've, I've been on my own existential journey on my life path this year. And what's really been um, super fun for me is I feel like you and I are working towards the same ultimate goal. And I, and I feel like our paths have been running parallel and all year I'm like looking over like, damn, she's doing some really cool shit over there. And then meanwhile, I'm like, well, I'm, I got this stuff that I'm doing. And so um, you've had a hell of a year. Like, let's just go ahead and, and kind of open with that where, you know, I started following you maybe like a year and a half ago and you're sitting at like 60,000 followers and your content was just soul woking and riveting and um over the past year you've you've gone from 60,000 you've gone viral you've gone to a million followers and I've been watching you continue to just pour out your heart and soul with this amazing content that has reached so many 
thousands upon thousands. Now we can say millions of people. Um, so I'd love to just kind of hear to start the convo hear a little bit from your perspective on like what a year it's been and how it's been for you as you've just been doing, doing your thing. Cause like what I think, cause I know from my perspective, I'm over here just doing me. And when you're focused on just doing your thing, but then all this crazy stuff is going on around you, it's kind of trippy. So I'd love to hear what that's been like for you. And we'll just dive in. Absolutely. When you said the millions, Brendan, I have to admit, I, I had a visceral, very kind of chilling reaction because I think it's still really hard on a personal level as I'm doing my thing to wrap my head around yeah. what the collectiveness aspect of it. But I say that because I think this leads into what has really been emblematic for me this year is I think that the viral nature that I agree with you, I had little expectation coming yeah. on when I last July, it was when I decided to take to even take to social media, I had my own personal account, I had my private practice. So I had a little, you know, mindful healing moniker up, I wasn't really using it, though, in any particular way. So when I decided to first come online, I had no no real expectation except needs on my from my perspective, which were I think twofold, one personal and one professional. The personal was, I was really, I was already well along in my dark night of the soul, physical health crisis, spiritual health, emotional health crisis, and my healing from it. So from a personal perspective, I was really lonely and isolated because within that journey, I started to look around to others around me, relationships that I had had for years upon years at this point, wasn't really seeing people outside of my partner, which I am ever grateful for even mm -hmm. having a person to share that sort of really deep emotional and yeah. challenging at times experience with. I was looking around and I was feeling really isolated, really misunderstood and, and really alone on a personal level, on a professional level, because I was really coming to terms. I'm really happy that you threw one of the words that you threw functional in front of Brendan was spiritual mm -hmm. because as, as maybe surprising, to some listeners as this might be, and I actually did a post or I incorporated this in a post this week, the soul, the mm. spirit is non-existent. And I'm talking from a prof professional standpoint in the training program of mental wellness mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form, even though, you know, there's origins in the word psychology wrapped up around Soma soul, that concept is not actually addressed. Yeah. in any way shape or form so doesn't psyche mean soul it sure does so <laughs> what, it's just interesting because it's not it's very much the traditional model and this is why i'm so motivated on a professional level to get this information out there to other mm -hmm. practitioners it is there's the mind the brain and then there's the body and you know they are talk about those parallels they are non non-connected in, a, in any way. So coming to a professional awareness that I was out of alignment with that or with my new, I should say, with my new weaponry of all of the science of epigenetics and psychoneural, everything I was learning, the gut and all of the things that your, your audience is very well aware of. I, I had a very hard reckoning with my professional self uh, that I could not work. It, would, it wouldn't serve me or my clients or my future, or my soul, bring that word back in, to continue to work in that very traditional way. So social media initially became a personal outlet for connection, but a professional outlet for me to be able to carve out a space where I could speak my truth and mm. not know where that truth would take me. Uh, very early on, I started to see the traction and, and the, the fact that people were overwhelmingly resonating. So I, I, I see that my viral growth of this past year really as a testament to where the collective is, their mm -hmm. readiness, their frustration maybe with older models. I think on a, a level and why I'm so relatable is because I think I'm giving words to these very very universal experiences, whether it's crises of physicality, crises of the soul, crises of emotionality that we're all experiencing. And mm -hmm. you'll always, Brendan, hear me talk or describe humans from our conception on this planet However, you think we get here, I use two adjectives very particularly, intuitive and adaptive, but mm -hmm. I think I'm speaking to that intuitive 
knowing that a, that the collective is waking up to on a very universal level. So while yes, I show up every day, I put the content out, I show you or show the followers that I'm human and right mm-hmm. along with you and healing right along with you. Um, I think it's a testament to, you know, the, the fact that we're all in that same place and it's been a whirlwind for me in a lot of ways. It's been very confirmatory, mm-hmm. my own inner knowing in yeah. a lot of ways. And it's been incredibly supportive because in the professional sense, I had a lot of fear going yeah. speaking these new truths as I knew them, because I, I know universally, no mental health clinician is being, or to my knowing, if, if we're being taught some of it, not my program was I, but maybe some program, it's not to this full knowing. And mm-hmm. I was concerned, I think about, or scared, you know, just worried yeah. about what peers would think of these new messages of not only the new, you know, tools and science and concepts, but of the concept of the ability to self heal because mm-hmm. I think it's so against everything that most of us were taught. And again, overwhelmingly positive. I mean, I have therapists that are reaching out to me very directly asking me, can I use your materials? Or I have people contacting me. My therapist gave me your Instagram handle and here I am. And I've been offering professional mentorship sessions because I think people are start the therapist practitioner side of things. They're realizing that they're limited. They're feeling very much like I did and they're very welcoming. So it's just been overwhelmingly supportive in all amazing ways. Man, it's, it's been so fun. And, you know, it's, it's really this uh, self-healing movement and, and awakening. And I love how, you know, cause self-healing it's, it's the only way forward. Uh, and that's where like, you know, I had you on the uh, FDN webinar early, earlier this year. Cause I, you know, I look at it as like the, the whole theme of this podcast with the, the functional fitness, functional medicine, spirituality, psychology, and all that. Um, you know, we're in this kind of holistic awakening. And so certainly a lot of what you just said, um, is exactly also what's going on in the functional medicine space. And, and that's where, what I am seeing is this holistic movement is really kind of, um, a generational thing as well. It, you know, with functional medicine, I was going to school full time while working full time as a trainer and nutritionist. And I knew like functional medicine is what I wanted to do. I knew uh, I wanted to run lab testing and help people get healthy and, you know, reach optimal health and all that. But something I was literally just conversing about yesterday, I say all the time, there's no such thing as a doctor of functional medicine, nor is there a doctor of holistic psychology as far as I know. So that's where when I was younger, uh, I ended up dropping out of college, dropping out of school to expand my education that way. And then, you know, these days I literally travel the nation lecturing to medical doctors, naturopaths and all sorts of, you know, progressive forward thinking. Um, Literally, there was at one of the conferences, you know, it was more of a mental health and psychiatry. Every conference has a different theme, oncology, gastroenterology, mental health, et cetera. And so there are a lot of psychiatrists out there in, at the functional conferences talking about how the psychiatric model is just kind of dead and, you know, dying. But anyways, the point being, um, I think as we are all starting to kind of look at our reality through the holistic lens, and that's where, um, are you a fan of Joe Dispenza's work? Are you? I, I mean, fan? I feel silly yeah. asking. No, no, absolutely. He he, I think I could attribute him to my first introduction to the scientific reality behind mm-hmm. some of these more, you know, for the, I think the collective word, woo woo concepts of yeah. you know, manifestation and the power of the mind intuitively. And that's actually, interestingly enough, what brought me into the field. I intuitively was always going to be, I think, similar to you, a psychologist, mm-hmm. not necessarily well, yes, I'm a considerate person. I like to help people. But I think when you ask most other practitioners, or at least a significant majority, they want to go into health. Mm-hmm. Mine was always this fascination with the mind and how powerful and wanting to really understand humans in that more psychological way. But that's what drew me into it. Um, 
But with that said, I think it wasn't until I, so I had never heard of these. I knew intuitively the mind was powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, I obviously saw the secret on the first very universal iteration of it when it came out as the movie. And I, I was really skeptical, if I'm perfectly honest. I'm like, oh, okay, I manifest a million. It's on my doorstep. I don't know about that. So it wasn't until I met Dr. Joe's work mm-hmm. that I saw, oh, I, I was introduced to quantum physics. and Yeah and the reality of it. So he was, he's been really influential mm-hmm. and, been, you know, a, a model for a role model for me of, I think, forging this new terrain backed mm-hmm. by, you know, I think what a lot of us are compelled toward science. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, you know, it's like, for me, my journey really started, you know, a decade ago with, it was more of an obsession with fitness. And then that turned into an obsession with metabolic science and then functional medicine. And, but then the deeper that you dive into, like, how do we achieve vibrant health and a vibrant quality of life? Before you know it, you end up down the rabbit hole, you know, of, of stuff like Joe Dispenza is all about. And the, the deeper, because I am, you know, one of my favorite sayings, I was just saying this in my workshop the other day, but I like to keep my head in the clouds, but feet on the ground. And, you know, maybe that's just me uh, wanting to be taller than 5'8". I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you laughed. They laughed too. So I guess I'll, I'll chalk that joke up for, you know, future use. Um, but, you know, the point being, like, I like to explore, like, n- to, to, to me in my mind, nothing's off the table. I want to explore everything from every angle. There's no rules. Reality is what we choose to make it. But let's keep our feet on the ground and, you know, stay grounded, stay rooted in, you know, kind of objective science. And so that's where, you know, Joe is certainly working on bridging that gap and kind of the multi-discipline, multi-science. But that's kind of the weird thing about it. It's like, well, shouldn't science, which is just the study of kind of the world and life around us, why are we isolating different branches? We study biology in a vacuum. We study, uh, you know, psychology in a vacuum. We study spirituality as organized religion in a vacuum. And and so that's where, you know, one of my favorite uh, little lines, you know, everybody used to say thoughts, thoughts become things. One of my favorite new lines is thoughts become proteins. And that's where it's like, well, this is, we're starting to get more accurate with how this goes together. If like, okay, well, we're going to talk a lot about ego. I know we're going to get there, but it's like, it all starts up here with our chosen beliefs, our chosen thoughts. And then that forms neuroplasticity that changes epigenetic expression, that changes protein folding, that changes your biochemistry and physiology. And so I don't know, it's just amazing as we kind of stop doing the vacuum thing and we're starting to, and that's where the leaders are, you know, the Joe Dispenza's and the Nicole's of the world and, you know, whatever, but that's the collective consciousness that is us progressing forward with our sense of understanding, you know? Yeah, 100%. And to speak to a point you made earlier, there, there is no holistic psychology anywhere, mm-hmm. because truth be told, as someone who loves certificates and letters, I very desperately was looking once I, on, you know, once I was healing, I'm like, okay, these things are working. Talk about ego the very insecure part yeah. of me was not really confident in speaking about it unless I had those credentials after mm-hmm. my name. Say, like, oh, I trained in this, I know this. So I looked around desperately, Brendan, and I was like, where, where, where are these? Pro- okay, maybe it wasn't my program I went to, but there has to be a program out there that's talking this language, that's marrying, to speak to your point, the whole of us, the interconnectedness, and even maybe speaking about the soul. I know that there is a very good spirituality psychology spiritual psychology program out in um in california somewhere yeah. i'm blanking on where it is but nothing i don't believe it no program as far as i could see it was really integrating all three of the parts the mind the body in particular mm-hmm. that's largely left out so at that point i i had to walk through that fear and say okay well you know again so while i have twofold mission i think on my time on this on this, you know, journeying about earth. And one of them is to continue to empower humans. And something I want to say about this, because I think what inspires me the most is while I always knew maybe kind of conceptually, theoretically, like I was saying earlier, that the mind is ever powerful. Mm -hmm. It can do anything. 
I never lived that experience. Yeah. I lived under much more of limiting beliefs, whether it was my biology, the genetics that I was granted or not granted. I was very much containing myself in my box of possibilities. So mm -hmm. while like it was a theoretical concept and I'd read the books about people who, you know, generated healing with thought alone, you know, mm -hmm. the reality that it does, you know, call it, I love that impacts protein, but I didn't live that until I began to fully embrace all of these tools. So now I, I don't think that anything teaches beyond wisdom, the wisdom of life experience. Now that I've given myself that, and I truly believe of the ever present capacities of a human, that's, I think, what continues to inspire me to impart those tools on humanity. But back to the professional side of things, another big goal of mine, and like I said earlier, is to provide on as global of a scale as I can, whether it's, you know, virtual training program, just some way to, in a, for those of us who want the certificate or the kind of more contained training, so similar to what you're doing, going around and teaching professionals, that's a, a very big goal of mine is to be able to continue to expand professionals and their knowledge so that we can start to have conversations and a shift I've made in my language is, you know, since I began this journey is into mental wellness and not just illness, the illness approach, the deficit approach that a lot of us are stuck in. Mm -hmm. I think that mirrors that transition that I was, you know, describing now that I've embodied because I thought I was stuck in that illness category. I'm someone yeah. who the boxes of anxiety, of panic disorder, you know, and again, I thought my conversation was management. Mm -hmm. There was only some range of life that I would be able to experience that I would never get wellness. But now that I've lived that experience, I very intentionally do believe, use that word of mental wellness and mm -hmm. do believe similarly to you that that needs to be a topic of conversation. We're not just talking about managing illness, right. you know, anymore. We're actually, it is possible for all humans to talk about actually achieving wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, in it's, uh, this is good segue too, cause it's, it's all about the, uh, the reframe and something I think when I was a little bit more early in my journey and awakening, if you will, and maybe a little bit, I don't know, uh, existentially immature or something, because I think as you start thinking on things and you kind of start pulling that thread, um, you know, it's, it's easy. It's, it's the ego reaction to, uh, kind of get like butt hurt over, you know, it's like, Oh, I've realized that that thing that my parents did it, you know, that was the trauma and that really screwed me over. And, you know, the, the initial reaction is like anger or, um, you know, with the, the system. So like in the functional medicine space at first it, when you get into functional medicine, it's, it's very easy to kind of be like, well, you know, screw big pharma and conventional medicine. What a stupid mo you know, you, you get that way, but then the deeper you get into it, it's like, okay, well, no, like it shouldn't have ever become this, you know, big pharma running the world and this, you know, multi-trillion dollar industry. And now, you know, you, you watch TV and it's like, okay, here's your sugary orange juice. Here's the next medication that you should ask your doctor about that might kill you while we, you know, and uh, just, and then the very next commercial is, um, Hey, uh, if you have been diagnosed with uh, lymphoma and were exposed to glyphosate, you may be entitled to compensation. Like that's the world we're living in today. And, um, I think everybody's just, you know, sick of it and they're craving something that feels authentic and real. And it's, it's all about the reframe of, so like with functional medicine, I was lecturing, um, at this oncology conference, like a couple weeks ago, somewhere in Seattle, you know, and at first it's like, I, it was such a humbling experience because it's like, wait a second, how does a 27 year old dude without a college degree from Kansas, what does he have to teach 300 medical doctors about cancer treatment? you know, but then actually like, it was a pretty damn good lecture. And I was, you know, because, and I thought about that and I was like, well, so, <laughs> you know, I was talking to somebody last night and, and I'm just like, okay, well, but here's the thing, here's the difference is, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't study disease and I don't study disease treatment with pharmaceuticals and surgery. I study health, you know, I study human health. 
and I study what disrupts human health. And that's everything. So, I mean, that lecture was showing the connection between basically microbial imbalances, toxins, and how that fuels the, the inflammation and oxidative stress that fuels cancer growth. But, but it's not just that too, because, you know, zooming out, it's not like, even though my, my professional niche is, you know, mold microbes, methylation, bugs, and detox and all that shit. Um, but it's so much more because that's where we see the interconnectedness of all things. We need the spiritual work. We need the psychological, we need the, it, nobody talks about fitness and functional medicine. It blows my mind. There's not enough fitness and functional medicine and there's not enough functional medicine and fitness. And then meanwhile, psychology and spirituality are, are their own camps. I'm like, guys, we need all the things, yeah. you know, but I think um, one of the big things I wanted to, whew, what I see with a lot of your work is this, this reframe technique kind of thing. Right. And it's like this, this idea of, you know, we choose how to interpret anything that gets thrown into our reality. And I think people forget that they have the choice. Yes. And so what I love, uh, and, and I think this is one of the things where your work is so, immensely applicable to like every human on this planet and you break it down so well of like, okay, here's what your ego is projecting. Uh, here's the positive reframe. Like here's a different way. So I'd love to hear you speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and something, so I, I do an illustration, you know, or I, I offer an illustration because I think this really embodies what you're talking about and the evolution that opens us up for the possibility of change. The word, Brendan, that I have had heard, had lived and had heard in that my old practice, you know, people coming week after week was the word stuck. Mm. Because what, just to really simplify it, but what therapy is, right? You come in a room, you sit, you lay on the couch, whatever you do, you're talking. You're talking from a very conscious mind state more often than not, right? You're not necessarily super emotionally activated, you know, maybe triggers are acutely present. So you're in your conscious mind. So you can have incredible awareness and insight. So I will always simplify the process of change. I think that's what a lot of us are here to do, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's in functional world or in psychological world or really on, on the planet in general, but two steps, awareness or consciousness. Mm -hmm. right? Second step being, so we have to have the understanding. We have to be in that conscious mind state or else we're living in that subconscious part of our mind. Again, back to school just for one second, yeah. never mentioned, never once was this world, the subconscious part of our mind, what's happening back there, how it's running the show 95% of our day, never once was that touched upon, right? So, so consciousness, and then second step is change, you have mm. to start to execute new behaviors, new thoughts, etc. right? So it doesn't come one without the other. So back to the therapy experience, or the traditional model, or even general life, I can have an insight, right? So I can say, okay, this pattern doesn't work. You know, when this thing happens in my life, I want to do y, X, Y, or Z differently. I can have a great 50 minute conversation even with my, my old patients about that. What happens then in real life are two things. I'm an autopilot. So I'm actually not consciously making new choices. So my autopilot, that subconscious part of my mind, we're very habitual beings, creatures, oh, totally. whether it's, our daily behaviors, our thoughts, and then the emotions speaking, I think to your, your, your zone of expertise, how they affect our bodies, mm -hmm. right? Very pattern, very habitual. So I'm living in autopilot, repeating my past. I think that's kind of really kind of Joe Dispenza does a great job talking about that, how we just become that walking, you know, being of our past and not of our future. And, or when I'm emotionally, when those deeper traumas or wounds are touched, I'm definitely then reacting from that deeper emotional place, which brings me why I'm stuck. Great, insightful conversation this Tuesday. Next Tuesday comes in. I have the awareness. I know exactly what I'm going to do differently. I've left. I've lived on autopilot. I've become emotionally triggered. I get the same report from my clients and I've lived it myself the next week where oh, I did that same thing again that I didn't want to do. So the illustration that I offer to people to speak to your point that we are a walking, I call it a filter. We're filtering our world. We are an active participant. So what we believe to be true, we have no reason but to believe this because we've experienced this one version, which is very simply, 
thing happens out there. I feel some kind of way. I do reactively some kind of habitual thing. I always do when I feel that kind of way. Living that life, as far as I see it, and I've lived it, very understandably makes me feel I'm reacting to the world I am. That's exactly what happened in that chain of events. That thing made me feel, and then I did Mm -hmm. this thing, right? So very disempowering. I'm a victim, in a sense, to everything around me because I'm just I'm a reaction. Right. Usually a repeated reaction from my past. So I'm getting the same result and the same result. I'm frustrated and I'm angry with everyone and everything around me. When we begin to practice consciousness or the ability to observe what I'm most interested in is our internal world, those Mm -hmm. internal filters, what we come to realize as uncomfortable, I think, as this realization is for a lot of us, the reality we're living is, same example, that thing happens. I run it through, I call it a filter. I run it through a filter. I've interpreted it. I've placed a meeting on it. I've drawn up some past experience that's somewhat similar and that is what caused that reaction and then that reactive behavior mm-hmm. as it were. Right. So again, while uncomfortable, Ooh, geez, you know, that's what really, I said when, when my phone didn't ring back, I'd made this about the person I know that loves me, not loving me anymore. Of course I'm hurt. And of course I'm screaming and yelling at this person. At least now I become a participant. It can be an mm-hmm. imp- the reframe I like to offer here is always for one of empowerment. So now I can, well, eesh, yikes, I know where maybe that filter came from, and that's a hard knowledge to carry. I wish it weren't the case. However, knowing that I've played a part or my mental world has played a part, at least now inserts me into the equation for change mm-hmm. moving forward. So I'm, I'm happy you kind of segued into that because I think that's a really empowering mm-hmm. reframe that I like to offer to people. Of course, then, Brendan, the practice of that self-observation is, is, is a practice. You have to take right. commitment. We have to be aware, first and foremost, that we're having thoughts all day long yeah. and that they are coloring our experience all day long, right? And then we have to practice in real time. This mm-hmm. all comes with practice, watching those thoughts, seeing those filters, understanding now and creating that space where I don't have to react in that old way because I can choose to apply a new filter now and make mm-hmm. room for a new response now and actually create a future that is more in alignment with what I would like it to be. Mm, boom. You know, uh, that was amazing. And you, you just took a lot. Like, I think about um, how much work and time and energy it took for me to kind of learn some of that on my own. And so the fact that you have been able to dissect that and break it down into, I mean, the way you broke that down from model standpoint is brilliant because I I liked a lot of what you said as far as, um, you know, you almost kind of have to challenge people with like, are you, uh, are you choosing to remain a victim of your, uh, domestication and kind of subconscious, uh, patterns and behaviors that you're not, you know, because it is, it's like, oh, this, this, the lesson keeps showing up until you learn the lesson, you know? And so until, um, but also it's like the right teacher appears when you're ready to learn the lesson. I don't know. You could get into a lot of stuff with that, (laughs) but it really just kind of comes down to, it's like, look, if, if, you know, I don't know if I would call it, um, you know, uh, living in Nirvana or just living at your highest vibration but I really believe, you know, we feel our best when our innermost truths are in harmonious alignment with all of our outward actions and and words. Right. And so it's like, well, first you have to dig to find your innermost truths and find your most authentic self. And then you have to live in alignment with everything that you do in, in the, the real world and with all of your projections of energy. And so if somebody is unhappy you know, I always, I always like to sort of preach that, like, you know, um, you know, your, your, your reality is like a projection of your belief system. So if you're not happy with your reality, you need to start looking inwards at what are your beliefs. And a lot of it is, I like how you talked about the, the subconsciousness, because, you know, that's, again, when I, I like to look at everything through the lens of just like evolution, like take all the emotion out of it. Like, let's just look at it from a biological evolutionary standpoint. And that's where I really look at like ego as sort of this primordial 
uh, mechanism that is just part of us and ingrained into us. And it's kind of this self-serving self-defense mechanism of, you know, our ego is supposed to react. It's supposed to be self-interested. That's, you know, oh, I'm, I'm a caveman in that dark, scary forest. I'm going to make assumptions and projections of that dark, scary forest might be painful. It might be dangerous. Like I might not, you know, these, but in today's world, you know, of modern society, uh, it's, it's such a trap of ego seduction, you know, and, and it makes it very blurry. And so, you know, I like to challenge people with like, okay, if, um, something's upsetting you or, or something triggers you, um, great. That's a learning opportunity. Like you got to reel that fish in like, Ooh, what, Ooh, that, that, and if, if you have a good reaction uh, to the stimuli that is in a self-serving, and when I say that, I mean a higher consciousness, like in your best interest on your higher path, like not just like, ooh, ego fulfillment, give me more ego waffles, where's the syrup? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, but if it actually is serving your higher growth, okay, great. Maybe that's a pattern that you don't need to mess with. If it's not broken, why fix it? But if it causes a negative reaction, right? You know, we've got those two wolves. One is full of unconditional love. The other is full of jealousy and rage. You know, which wolf wins? Well, whichever one you feed, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so I think people need to explore that. And I love how you're able to break that down. And, and as you said, so then once the consciousness, the awareness has been triggered, and thanks to you, you are making it much more easy to, understand like, oh, well, what I thought I was doing was this and I was totally lost, totally stuck, but now I see. And so then you have the two choices of you can either choose to remain a victim, you know, and, and choose to, I like how you said that, like a victim of your own, um, however you put that versus, okay, well now you have the choice to be an active player, you know, in that. And something like Joe Dispenza I'm sure we'll talk about plant medicine at some point, but, you know, Joe spends with plant medicine, kind of the idea of plant medicine of, you know, being that stimuli that allows you to take your, your brain and your neural networks to places that ha probably has never gone before, not in a sober state. And then once you have laid that neural network, you are now able to forge that path. Like if you don't know that there is a path yeah. and you didn't know that it was possible to have this path here, you know, and if this stimuli helps you kind of lay that one stone, oh, well, okay, now let me, in a sober state, continue to build that path. But I'm just rambling. I'm all over the place now. Yeah, no, I no. Know. I actually want to, so just because I like, I'm going to marry a word you used earlier too. I think a great way to simplify the state I was describing earlier, a victim. Yeah. Victim of conditioning. You used the yeah. word domestication. I often, Brendan, talk in evolutionary terms, because at our core, we are an animal in that sense. We have those brain regions that are in service of protection. So mm -hmm. you know, very astutely, the way you're describing ego, I heard you wrap that word up in there, which is that of protection. And I actually find the process of healing to be a process, you know, the onion analogy that I think we love to use, but it fits like of peeling back all of those layers of conditioning mm -hmm. to that because sometimes, and maybe some listeners are like, oh, well, what is authentic self? I know I get that question a lot. I don't know who I am, right? So it's actually, in my opinion, a, a process of unlearning all of that conditioning. So back to those adjectives that I used, right? Intuitive, so that we can respond, we can return, we can peel back those adaptations to return to those. That's what I, that's what conditioning is, a series of adaptations that we made in life at different yeah developmental periods where we had no better option and then we've maintained them over time because again our subconscious is in service of keeping us safe right so we can return back to that intuitive intuitive state of being which is again as far as, as I describe it at least pure awareness and part of the work that I'm trying to do and I'm happy that it, it translates um, in this way is to make some of these concepts that these have existed. In, I'm not new. I am not a, a sage delivering any, this has been, I mean, I've read really early, even Christian science-based text where this is what is being talked about. So this mm -hmm. is not, I, you know, this is not new. This is mm -hmm. wisdom passed through the ages, 
But I think why it's gotten lost and not maybe utilized, and maybe this is why the psychological fuel, aside from any conversation we want to have about funding and all that, you know, which is another time and place, but why it's been, it's, it's not been utilized as effectively is because I don't think it's been translated Mm -hmm. in as approachable of a way or in a way that can be understood. It has felt a little too esoteric. Mm-hmm. a little too woo-woo for even mm-hmm. myself at times. So part, part of my big goals and intentions always, and I'm really happy when I hear that people acknowledging that it does translate. I, oh, I can understand awareness and consciousness as opposed to my my autopilot in my daily life. And that's always going to be a motivator for me because we need to know how to use some of these things that are our reality, how to know what is the conditioning and begin to differentiate this is my condition pattern versus this is that higher self. Mm-hmm. And then to be able to ask ourselves and give ourselves a choice of choosing the wolf that better serves us in that mm-hmm. moment. It's amazing. You know, and, and I love, um, I think it's really interesting just the, the age we live in today, because, you know, you, you said a lot of cool things in there and um, that's something I've written about before. And I think uh, I agree too. of like, (laughs) the funny thing is like, you know, I'm not a sage either. And and I love that you said that because that's something, you know, um, like imposter syndrome is a very real phenomenon. And, you know, I'm only speaking for myself when I say like, I know I've had some imposter syndrome, uh, ego battles and stuff throughout this year and whatnot. Um, and it's, it really comes down to like, you know, none of this is, is really like new. It is that unlearning. I, I've written about it before where I think the process of self-discovery is purely a process of, of unlearning. And, um, it's been a huge year of unlearning for me and kind of reconnecting with some of my roots as a random example of like, I was a martial artist growing up, like martial arts. It was my, my shit as a kid, I was a little ninja, uh, <laughs> Nicole, but, um, I got away from it. You know, it's like you adult on and and then I was like, but then as I kind of unlearned and sort of, you know, rediscovered uh, my inner child, you know, it's like, dude, you, you were a ninja and you loved like the, the morals of the martial arts culture, the honor, the discipline, the integrity and Brendan, like you live your life in that way. Why? So anyways, my point being like, the more you connect with those authentic roots, the more you peel back those layers of, uh, domestication, whether those were domestications that your, you know, your caregivers, your peers, your environment, or even self domestication. Um, and I love what you said, though, because, you know, a couple names pop in my head, one of which uh, my friend Sashin Patel, uh, who's a big health coach dude, and we were hanging out this weekend. Do you know Sashin? I do. I do. Ah, oh my gosh, we all got to hang Not out. Not personally, but I'm familiar with his work for sure. Oh, he's so cool. He's such a, such a Yoda dude. We're, we're, he, he's, he's coming on this show eventually. And then, um, what's his name? The guy that wrote, wrote, uh, the Toltec wisdom books Four agreements. Have you read those? I have. Oh my I gosh. I, well, and so it's it, the reason I bring up those two names is um, something that I observe is I think a lot of the morals and wisdom uh, that have been integral for our species throughout history and throughout every successful like ancient civilization, you know, you look at the the uh, Bushido or the the code of honor that samurai lived by, and you know, samurai means to serve, or uh, the Toltec wisdom, you know, and the Toltec culture or, you know, Aztec or or Native American, the point being, we have so much ancient wisdom. uh, And a lot of these ancient wisdoms and morals and values are grossly missing in modern America, you know, and so I think, uh, and I really do kind of blame the technology jump where just this past weekend, um, I learned that I think it was like psychological burnout is like a condition that is starting it's and it's not even considered a disease but like a phenomena by the world health organization or something of like psychological burnout and that's where i think we're also in this kind of weird age where you just look at how much 
life for the human species has changed in the past like 50 years because you know it's 2020 so 100 years ago was like the great depression and look at just how different reality is and you know i got my first cell phone when i was 15 it was you know flip phone t9 texting so hi dr nicole would have taken me all day Whereas now we have access to all the information in the world that our species has ever created all the time. And it's like our gray matter is not prepared for that stimuli. And so I think we're kind of in this, but in a way I feel like we need to give, we we're always so harsh on ourselves. We judge ourselves so harshly and we're like, we suck as a species and da 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 and the world's screwed and chronic. But it's like at the same time though, I really feel like things have gone wrong just in the past 50 years. And I feel like we're already kind of going, whoa, whoa, guys, the chemicals in the environment, the deforestation, the chronic disease epidemic, the, you know, suicide at an all time high. And, you know, uh, loneliness is a predictive all cause mortality, you know, indice validated by plenty of research. And, you know, purpose is a uh, validated indice of longevity (laughs) yeah you know so it's just like it's insane um and that's where i think there is kind of this movement of reawakening of like whoa we really we lost ourselves and i think now everybody's trying to find themselves again and with this radical acceptance right um you know i think about uh you know gay acceptance and uh, transgender and all this stuff. Cause we live in this world where the world is now telling everybody you're allowed to be whatever you want and we will accept you. That's, that's the message. But then all the while everybody's struggling of like, well, so my point being in a world where you can be anything, you can identify as whatever you want you, you theoretically will be accepted. So then what, what should you be? You know, and my, my thought is like, Mm, like the best version of your most authentic self question mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what I was, the word that kept popping up as I was listening to you talk, Brendan was choice. This I I talk about in terms of technology too, because I I do agree. I believe we've set up a system of dichotomies in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, Oh, I just, technology is bad, right? The social media world is bad. I don't think anything is so, black and white. I think it really comes down to choice, right? So we are, I agree with you. I pat humans and humanity and the evolution on the back all of the time. We have a never ending, as far as I see it, array of choices now, whether it's what we do, how quickly we do it, where we live, what we eat, right? What information we consume, Mm -hmm. when, how much information, when we're, right? We, we have endless choice. Really, back to that idea of participant in reality, we are gifted with getting to make those choices each and every moment. So just because it's there, I mean, again, I've been able to pivot my life, essentially, my professional life. My, I've been able to heal myself. Let me back it up. Even before I got to be a new professional in this new way of being, I got to heal myself because of the endless amount of information that was available to me. Right. So I really think it comes down to choice that we're making, how we're using, how we're consuming just because it's there. And I get this question a lot too, when people villainize it, right? Oh, Mm -hmm. things are getting worse because my my response is always the same though. This might be unpopular to hear, which is now it's endlessly available. Like I said, so now I can pick up my phone and compare myself to a million trillion Instagram accounts. That doesn't mean that I've just become an individual who compares myself to others. I was comparing myself to Sally down the block. I just had a much less smaller population Mm. around which to compare myself. I didn't become a new, it didn't bring out a new aspect of me. I was doing that all along. I was doing that with magazine. Again, maybe it wasn't as endlessly Mm -hmm. available or prolific. Mm -hmm. Now it is matter of extreme degree, I should say. Right. But again, if I'm the person who is always looking, you know, at the people that look better than me or have a better life than me. I was doing that. Like I said, in the magazine aisle, I was doing that in the grocery store. I was doing that. So acknowledging the truth that, okay, I, and you know, I compare myself to other people. Now I have to arm myself with choice 
with whether or not I need to put limits, possibly boundaries around Mm -hmm. my own usage then of things like social media or of the endlessly avail endlessly available content. But I agree with you because I think, and a lot of people talk about, you know, this mismatch. I live in a city. I'm sure you just heard the truck that just drove by in my city living apartment. Right. So that is, we're not geared, whether we're talking about information or living on top of people in cities, we are getting farther and farther. I think from our evolutionary roots, however, we're getting more and more aware and possibly mm-hmm. more and more connected to those roots to, to allow ourselves to make more and more informed decisions mm-hmm. toward our, our highest self. Right. You know, and that's, that's kind of the thing, you, you know, and certainly I, I'm not here for uh, the whole, you know, if, if there are people that are not evolutionary minded, this might be not be the podcast for them, but you know, just evolution still going on. Like Darwinism is still in full effect. It's just a little bit more messy and complicated. You know, we live in skyscrapers and in this virtual reality and, um, and it's cool. Like I was just watching, what was that movie? Like ready player one, I was watching on the plane the other day and just, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it speaks to that phenomena that's going on in our world. But, um, but you said it, it's, it's that inherent divine power of choice, you know, and to, to make an active choice to be that active player in your own, uh, world walk, uh, you've got to be aware and you've got to be conscious and you've got to be present. Um, and you know, so in that movie, the, the ready player one, and, you know, so they're all living in this virtual reality with their goggles on. And there was a joke in there that I thought was so funny because, you know, is the consumerism of like, oh, well you can put this many, um, pop-up ads into their display before inducing seizure. Um, and it was, it like, I was dying laughing because, you know, they were really just joking about, cause that's, mm-hmm. that is it. Like we. I think we need, you know, to incorporate into the school system, like how to responsibly consume technology when you've got a two, two year old, and this is a, a, a very um, new phenomena. I mean, again, 15 years old, first cell phone, and now we're here. And now a two year old can work an iPad better than me, Yeah, you know, and it's like, this is an adjunct to our brain, we have this amazing gray matter that's just capable of so much. And then we have this very, very powerful high speed tool. So it's going to amplify, but ultimately it is, you know, our choice. And we are, the farther we get away from our natural roots, it seems like the unhappier and sicker, you know, that we get. So I guess, you know, my hope, my vision, because I hate to say it, it brings me no pleasure, but it is something I say relatively frequently. But unfortunately, our, our species is parasitic to this planet. You know, if we look at it from a biological standpoint, uh, if you look at the definition of parasite that we created, it's like, yeah, we fit that definition on this planet. My hope is we can get to the point where we li- live symbiotically, you know, and yeah we're proliferating as a species, but in a harmonious, a, a symbiotic way with earth, but we got a lot of work to do, yeah. Nicole. Well, I think to speak to that work, and this is, I think, tying a couple of concepts, finding that we're talking about, which is, I believe that the authentic self of human. So we want to talk holistic, my body and soul. We're also holistically connected mm-hmm. to nature. Yeah. So returning to life in alignment, something we were talking about earlier on. I believe that as as more and more of us return to life in alignment, we're going to start to make the choices that are also in alignment, which are going to bring us back to living, you know, not to sound cliche, kumbaya, hippie, but in universally in love, you know, in connection and in harmony with not only other humans, but with all of the species on the planet. I think Mm -hmm. the choices that are resulting in the parasitic nature to use your language of humanity are choices that are out of alignment with our core being. And I I believe that we share this universally as human. Mm -hmm. I think that we all have that at our center. We don't, there's not, you know, kind of bad eggs in a sense. There's conditioning that has resulted in very bad choices Mm -hmm. and extremely horrific consequences, but 
I think that our return to that alignment in all areas, the mind, body, and soul, will bring us back mm-hmm. into that more communion with the planet, with global, you know, kind of people, places, humanity, bugs, you know, everything really. So I think that that's a, a testament of, of who we are at our core as humans. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. And I think, you know, I don't know. I, 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 it'd be interesting to have some conversations with, uh, you know, climate, you know, scientists that study climate change and all of that of like, what, what is the timeline that we're looking at here of like, when is it going to be like Blade Runner where the, the whole planet is just like a desert and we're fighting or like, what was that movie from the eighties, like water world or something like that. It's, <laughs> you know, I'm ready. I'm ready for that Terminator. It's not like we haven't seen it coming, whatever that is. But um, I think you're so right. I think at the core of our soul stuff, you know, we are connected to, the natural world around us, we're connected to the universe. And that's where I really like, um, you know, I was reading Joe Dispenza's book the other day and talking about, okay, when you get a lot of energetically compatible humans in, which you did this, which I, I just experienced this at, at the FDN conference this past weekend, but then you did it yourself with um, your group meditations that you've done throughout this year where when you get energetically compatible individuals together, it has this amplifying energetic effect that, you know, uh, per Joe's uh, claims and work, you know, okay, well then theoretically like that energy that gets manifested as uh, the collective vibration, you know, resonates, well then it has positive influences on like the economy or the health of the planet. And, you know, maybe that's a little too woo woo for some people like, oh yeah, people get together and it creates energy that heals the planet. But it's like, okay, whether that's in a literal way, a quantum physics way, a metaphorical way, I don't care what way you have to frame it to accept it, but how could it not be true? You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if it was Dr. Joe or another book I read. I I don't want to miss some book I read was referencing, and I was so struck by this, it speaks to this point, was referencing a, a, a loose study, obviously nothing, you know, kind of approved and IVR, but a loose study where um, I, they had a whole bunch of manifestors, or meditators, excuse me, and the goal was at one particular time in one particular area, people didn't know each other, their task essentially was, and again, I could be getting some of the details wrong, but the gist of it was the task was to meditate at the same time. And the group was large enough to speak that they were able to track. They probably only did like one indice, of course, because this wasn't a huge study, but where they were able to track, you know, that negative, I don't remember if it was crime or some sort of petty crime mm-hmm. reports for that time in that area dropped enough mm-hmm. that they document it that to be the case so again now you have that i think really global effect of you don't even have to be the human Mm -hmm. that's engaging in the vibrationally elevating act of meditation but it really does again because of the quantum field we are all energetically connected it can even affect things happening outside Mm -hmm. so when i read that i forget which book it exactly was in or the particular details of it but really really struck me Mm -hmm. and i agree with you i love how you worded that however you have to reframe it to metabolize it in some way Mm -hmm. right um Mm -hmm. it's incredibly empowering to do and incredibly because i i want to say this as well because i I see a dichotomy happening in the way we're viewing you know the conversation we're having the evolution of humanity and the planet and the world and it saddens me when people get so stuck not outside of the conversation about social media and technology and the negative effect it's having in general, I get so sad when I say, well, yes, I'm not going to disagree that, you know, climate and all of this stuff that's real, right? I'm not going to, it makes me sad when I see people so stuck in this, things are going bad, totally trajectory because I can make just as much of an argument that with this collective awakening, things are also going really good and Mm -hmm. the beauty. And I think part of our evolution process as a human is to make space Mm -hmm. for, you know, more than just the duality, more than just the black and white, where it could be, this is poor choices that are collectively being made. 
here are some amazing choices that are collectively being made. And then there's all in between happening all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, you know, I like that because sometimes I, you know, uh, especially this past year, um, because we're always evolving on our, on our path. And that's where you're, you're constantly having to kind of reevaluate, like, why do I think what I think? What, how do I know what I think I know? Why, why do I choose to spend all my time thinking about this? Cause I know for me, like sometimes I get too focused on the, Oh geez, chronic disease epidemic and, and how quickly we're killing the planet, you know, and it, it keeps me up at night. It gets me out of bed and, and I'm trying to live my truth and spread my message to, you know, help facilitate. But um, that's exactly it is also being conscious of like, well, there's a lot of good going on too. There's a lot of good stuff. And um, I think we were referring to like the exact same little experiment uh, done there. And I was listening to, uh, I'm sure you'll dig this kind of speaking of the quantum physics stuff. I think it was a podcast. I think it was Aubrey Marx's podcast and he had whoever it was on there. Um, some kind of quantum physics plant medicine dude. Um, but they were talking about this experiment and I don't know any of the terminology, so it's going to be botched, but the, the essence of it is like, okay, so laboratory scientists, uh, quantum physicists, and they've got this like particle cannon and they're shooting particles at some kind of object and it measures the particle activity. Right? So basically what they, um, what they saw was the particles, the quantum physics particles changed their behavior in the presence of human observation versus no humans around to observe. So then all of a sudden we open up this can of worms to say our presence, our very being here changes quantum physics reality as we know. And it's just like, Oh God. <laughs> Do you see smoke coming out of my ears? Cause I mean, wrapping your head around that, but that's it. I I've read very similar. Um, and it's incredibly mind blowing to yeah. simplify what I, what I feel, what I kind of experience when I read things like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know where to begin with that because then it's like, well, uh, it, Brennan, it, it sure sounds like you create your own reality. So what reality do you want to build? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful stuff. So Dr. Nicole, you started this membership thing. I'm very curious what this membership thing is that I've been seeing on your story. Absolutely. So speaking to the collective, um, I have over the course of my evolution of doing work in this new way, you know, help providing people. My goal is always to provide people with the tools to heal holistically yeah. and to talk about how to use those tools, which involves, you know, consistent daily change, consciousness and change. I was speaking up earlier. Um, I was doing so. So just something kind of as a background, when I, when I went online, when I started to talk about these tools, I've always kind of or promised to myself that I was always going to put all of it out there. There was never going to be, you know, some secret toolkit that only if you knew me or paid to work with me, would I, you know, share those with you because to speak, to excuse my French, but this shit is hard, yeah. you know? So I want to equip everyone around the planet with the tools to heal. Yeah. You know, I don't have, I don't feel proprietary over this. I want to spread that out. So that is what I started to do on my Instagram. And then, I started to work individually with people again, just really supporting them on a more individual basis in using the same tools that I was talking about more globally. And as I started to evolve the work back to that thing I was talking about earlier, one of my motivators of going on and connecting was connecting with humans and starting to not only speak my truth in alignment with my professional self, mm -hmm. but speak my personal healing truth too. Cause yeah. I am walking this journey alongside of my entire community and humanity at this point. And it's incredibly lonely and it was incredibly isolating. And I didn't feel like outside of my partner, which I'm ever grateful that I have her, I did not feel like I had people in alignment with me. So a motivator for me was to connect with other humans, you know, struggling in the same way that I was struggling, simplified and healing in the same way that I was healing and maybe dealing with the reality of being misunderstood from, yeah. you know, uh, by the other relationships that I had carried with me through different versions of myself and my own evolution. So going on. And so all of the while I had this nagging sense while I was working with individuals one-on-one -on -one that I was missing, 
you know, the biggest piece of what makes us a very social species, which is the community aspect. And yes. while I'm ever grateful for the squares of Instagram, and I've always made a promise to my followers that even though I am doing membership now and that is existing in the world, I am never going to stop doing and putting these tools out to humanity at scale the way yeah. that I am. But I understand the limitations of, I speak about different concepts each day when I'm posting. Right. I get a little square and I can't really, you know, kind of direct on that scale, a healing journey. So right. the way I, you know, kind of uh, was coming through, I was like, I need to do, I want to, I've always been as a therapist, which is funny in the field, in the practitioner side of things, groups are very divisive. Mm -hmm. You have people, you have therapists that love groups and embrace groups. I fall into that category. But I've always group work mm -hmm. was the first uh, clinical work that I was introduced to at the start of my program. And I walked very, you know, kind of, I ran into that opportunity mainly because I wanted to just start to work clinically with people at a time in my program where we were not yet fully allowed. It was at my master's level. So I wasn't allowed to be seeing people individually one-on-one -on -one mm. later in the program. So long story short, I was like, oh, a group's available. I can do that. I'll do it. Mainly because I just wanted to work with people. Yeah. I happen to love, I didn't know if I was going to like groups. I didn't know how dividing it would be. I love groups. A lot of clinicians are very shying away. I understand it's a, it's a different dynamic. I it love is. the dynamic. Part of developing the community of Instagram that I was so interested in fostering was so attractive to me because I like fostering groups and communities in, in that sense. So when I started to realize I wanted to put something out into the world that not only could be open to many more people than my just time would allow in my life with those yeah. one-on-ones. I mean, at some point I had, it was ridiculous the the wait list that, that I had accumulated. I, like, I just right. I can't service right. the people that I want to service, but I also know that I'm not fully servicing them with the whole of the experience of being human because the mm -hmm. community aspect was left out. So what I had come up with was, you know, a membership based model where it's a much smaller community than, I mean, it's even less than 1% at this point of the community of yeah. the million. So followers, right. So yeah. it's a place where I'm mirroring the exact same healing journey that I took my individual clients through, meaning we're going to focus in one area each month, each month, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about a topic of healing. It's going to get repetitive as hell. We're just going to work on one thing, you know, in that topic each month. Um, I've gotten some experts. I've connected with amazing practitioners you know, through the vehicle, social media mm -hmm. that are willing to come in and do different guest topics each month. Um, so there's a portal of learning and tools and resources that I'll be structuring and pacing for all of the members. And then there's, the community aspect, a group, mm -hmm. a private group where, you know, where it's, whether it's daily accountability, check-ins that, you know, I think a lot, the word accountable, yeah. I would ask people what they were, what their goals were for working with me individually and accountability came up more often than not. So yeah. that piece I've been able to foster, you know, a place where if you choose, you can go and you can keep yourself accountable externally through this group but also begin to foster connecting with other healers. And it's been incredible. I mean, it's just, just off the presses. It, it launched Friday. So we're, you know, we're all settling in as a community over the weekend and we're kind of getting some traction now moving forward. And I'm just, I'm so part of what I'm always open to. And you said something kind of referencing this earlier. Things are changing. Yeah. We're evolving. We're learning new science. So Never will you a ever hear me say that I'm an expert on yeah. never will you be hear me say that I'm set in. This is my theory and this is what it'll always stay. I am open yeah. to continuing to evolve. So similarly in terms of the community, the membership, you know, I just want to continue to make it to be something that it's virtual, but the connections I've made virtually have been everything. Totally. to me. I mean, this is why I'm speaking to you. You know, we've been parallel following each other's journey now, and now I get to interface with you. And I'm sure so soon when I'm out in LA living, we'll be able to actually meet it, you know? So it's, it's, it's everything. And my goal is to just continue to build a virtual space of healing for the collective of self healers that are mm. at this point international. I put up a poll in the group the other day. Yeah. Of I saw that. I was mind blown at the where people are coming and healing from and it's just mm -hmm. such a cool experience i yeah i was blown away when i saw that you've got people all over the world and 
I'm so glad that it, it's been fun because um, in a lot of ways, and, and this is where you've been a huge inspiration, you know, for me and even helping kind of shape my uh, path and ideas. And that's the beautiful thing about when, uh, you know, like-minded professionals, you know, we're all students of life, in my opinion. And, and that's where I really respect what you said about remaining open because, um, well, shoot, you know, functional medicine, bad boy, I'll just say it. There's a lot of ego in industry, um, you know, and that's where as I've gotten high up in, in that industry and people that I used to like worship and think were so cool. And I'm like, ah, uh, I'm not sure your vibration is for me, dude. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that and it's fine. But the point being, um, you know, as soon as that kind of, eh, you know, the, the nasty side of ego sort of latches on, it's you painting yourself in a corner, bruh. You know, it's, it's why limit yourself? It's your, you're inhibiting your own growth, your own evolution, your own next breakthrough. So, um, you know, I think at the fundamental core, remaining open and, and uh, staying a humble and hungry student of life. Uh, and that's really what I just heard from you. And I'm really glad to see, because you've been pouring out so much amazing content just for free out there. And it's interesting because over the past like year, year and a half, it sounds like we've kind of both gone from the one-on-one -on -one consulting model and then, okay, well, we have this kind of conduit that is social media to, you know, pour our light and love and knowledge out into the universe to help guide people in whatever way it resonates with them. Um, but you know, we too have been, and that's like, that's what this holistic savage thing is, is we run this group program and, you know, we're even shifting, um, cause the accountability, you know, I think, uh, we are a social species. We are a tribal species. I mean, that's how we evolved is we work together towards the, uh, collective benefit that is our continuity. Um, and so that's where like one of my friends, Karan, big, big deal microbiologist dude, um, owner of microbiome labs, you know, I was talking with him on the podcast and, you know, he was saying like, well, Brennan, like we are more bacteria than human. We have more bacteria in us, on us, all over us than human. And so again, when I kind of think of humans through that lens and I think of human as bacteria, you know, and you look at the scientific research and the psychological research, you know, just have fun on PubMed on a Friday night <laughs> and you'll find that, uh, you know, we achieve self-actualization, we experience fulfillment when we are in service to the collective consciousness, to the collective good. And it's like, well, of course we are. Like, that's how bacteria work. Bacteria communicate through uh, a mechanism called quorum sensing and they create biofilm. And, you know, the whole point is working together towards the proliferation and continuity of the species. And so I think with humans, like, well, we're no different and we get fulfillment. We get pleasure and fulfillment and achieve self-actualization when we are in service towards, you know, the, the greater good. So I think the work that you're doing is powerful and we have to use the power of tribe. We have to, you know, that's why holistic savage tribe, we have to, or the self healer tribe. It's we, we have to tap into the power of community because I'm sure, you know, and I know, from years and years of consulting with clients one-on-one, -on -one, starting with personal training and now functional medicine, one-on-one um, -on -one only gets you so far. Like you, um, the power of community, you know, if, if we've got one person trying to go gluten-free and I'm like, yeah, you really need to go gluten-free dog. And they're just like, yeah, Brennan always tells me I need to go gluten-free. <laughs> but then if I have a group of 50 people and they're all trying to go gluten-free, they're all trying to work on their, you know, microbiome or whatever it is, um, there's that group accountability and that group structure. And so you are able to more effectively help more people at a lower price point to them, you know, but also giving them more because you have this, this group accountability, this group energetic. Uh, so I'm sure you're, you know, you're going to crush it with that. So I've got to ask though, because I could very easily see all the work that you've done. You easily have enough content for a course or a book question mark. Question. So I just want to back to the groups, I think, from a psychological perspective, evolutionarily, I just want to mention the studies of the not only division of labor stress, they've studied now, right, that being a part of a group. So add that to accountability as well, the stress relieving aspect. So to speak to your example, 50 people going gluten free, stressful as hell, maybe I'll have to make new choices. And, you know, my body is going through these withdrawals. I'm not well, right? Really stress relieving 
um, capacity, or, you know, it, stress is relieved when we are connected with one or more. Mm. And I think that's another part of it because again, change, evolution, growth is not easy. Mm. It's stressful as hell. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, part of it, what we're doing is to relieve the stress in our life, but it's not an easy process. So I mm -hmm. think that speaks to the point of it too. But so, um, so in terms of programs, I definitely eventually want to be doing some self-directed course content. I'm really aware that people learn in, in very different ways. So now that I've worked with enough people through their healing journey, and now that I'm doing it in a group mm -hmm. modality, uh, I think, you know, down the line, I will be equipped to put together a self-directed version of a program where people who maybe want to just have the time and space to really go at their own pace in these different areas. I mean, at this point, I've accumulated a lot of topical areas that are of real interest and need for people to get the information and get the daily tools to implement. So that's definitely down the line. Um, in terms of a book, you know, stay posted. Um, I've been manifesting it and there is something possibly in the works that I'm not yet allowed to speak more publicly on, but funny you asked. Um, so <laughs> definitely. But again, I just see those options as being a different way to deliver the same message to a different maybe population of people that maybe aren't on social media or can learn a different way or want to navigate their journey, a more timeless, you know, kind of version of it too, where I can go and have access to this program or this book content forever. I can touch back. That's, that's the part I think too, of the work that I put out there. We can do it kind of sequentially in terms of a healing journey. Sometimes we just pick pieces that apply to us now or that apply to us at all. What I learn now in one concept area, a decade from now, this is for me too. I might learn, I might dive in a bit deeper. I might be ready for another layer of that onion to come up. So again, the, the cliche of it all, right? Healing is not linear. There's no upward trajectory. There's no as far, and I, this is something I've paid it to settle into. There's no done. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that the, the work that I do and the concepts that I use are timeless in a, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And we'll, we'll, I, I hope to put out that sort of content to be able to accompany people at different stages of their human journey. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. I mean, I, uh, I just, from my own experience of like, I was putting out all this content and I was like, Oh, let's make a course. So then I made a course and we released a course and then now I'm writing a book and it's just like, so, and I was like, I, I know, I know you've got all the stuff and, um, you know, I'm going to just go ahead and call myself your number one fan. But, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, a question that popped up and you mentioned that, and I loved what you said about like with the group program, um, and being able to, you know, meet, meet people where they're at. Right. And that's, that's just such a crucial concept. Uh, you know, that's working with clients one one. meet them where they're at, right. Where are they in their journey and how can you, uh, help guide them a little bit further on their journey. And, you know, I like what you said about, with the membership and in the program, they can um, kind of pace themselves in, because literally right before that, I had written down here, you know, the pace of self healing, something that I have uh, started observing on my own earth walk over the past couple of years is um, once you, whatever it is, uh, and I might ask you what your big aha awakening moment thing stimuli was, but like once you kind of have that thing in that moment, you start waking up a little bit, all of a sudden, um, it's, it's like you, it's almost like you think you see everything and it's just like, Oh geez, I have so much work to do. I have so much to explore and being the, the spastic man child that I am, I don't, I'm not good at pacing myself. You know, I'm just like full speed in all directions. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what advice you have to the masses on, how do you pace that self-healing? Because as you said, yes, you know, the point of healing and self-healing and doing that work is to heal, but it's, it's just like an infection or a, you know, musculoskeletal injury. There's going to be the inflammation process and the remodeling process of those tissues. It is a stressful uh, and demanding and energy sucking process. It's hard. And, you know, everybody 
is looking outwards when they need to be looking inwards. And there's nothing harder than looking inwards and facing those deep, dark seated traumas and scars. And um, so I don't know what, what advice do you have on how do you pace yourself? So you're not just like, because it's like working out, right? You can't just work out, work out, work out. The, the growth happens when you recover, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I want to start at the end because what you're highlighting at the end of that statement, right? Looking inward is hard. It's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's, it's painful, emotionally painful. So possibly to speak to the man child and you possibly not, but sometimes, <laughs> right? Or a lot of times, why do we change, Brendan? Yeah. We change because we're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we are governed by what I call the immediacy principle. I want to feel better now. Mm -hmm. Back to the conversation we were having earlier, we have access to immediates, to knowledge. Let me get five new things to do, to do lists of healing that I'm going to start tomorrow, right? That's my quickest way to feel better. If I do these five things, you know, obsessively for the next 20 days, maybe I'll be better on day 21. Yeah. Right. So I think a lot of, and I've had a pace my clients, you know, I think to their own displeasure through the healing journey, because sometimes, and I know I do this as well, we want to go as quick as possible through that discomfort. Yeah. But the reality of these healing tools, these are not magic elixirs. There is not, as far as I see it, a magical one experience, not a magical journal. There's not a magical meditation cushion. There's not a thing I can do as needed. I, just to wrap, you know, not to go too far deep in it. There's not a magical plant medicine trip or ayahuasca I can go do one time, right? As far as I say, there's not a magical retreat weekend that's going to change my life. If I don't take that reframe, take that insight, take those tools and live them consistently daily. Mm-hmm. So the thing I always say with this mode of healing and living in a lot of ways is consistency is what we're looking for. So mm-hmm. with that said, the way that I have had successful habit creation in my own life and in my clients' lives is through keeping those, I call them the small daily promises, mm-hmm. keeping those expectations of the new things that we're going to do as small as possible, as manageable as possible, because back to this subconscious area of the brain that is so in- important, it does not like change. Mm-hmm. It likes the familiar. Mm -hmm. So any, and this is why change is universally hard for people to either initiate and or maintain. So if you're someone, so for instance, my partner, I couldn't, I couldn't have picked a more opposite partner in so many ways. So we joke, our joke now is she, I think sounds to be like you. She is very, you know, kind of educates herself once she knows, okay, I'm going to do this new thing different. I mean, it starts Brendan tomorrow. She's off to the races. And I joke because I'm a turtle. I don't know. Mm. I want to try it on for size. Do I like it? And I'm definitely not going to do it on your time. I'm going to do it on my time. So if it's tomorrow for you, it might be next week. Cause I don't like to be told yeah. when to do the things. Right. So our joke always is I'm always, you know, dipping my toe in and she's always off to these races. However, off to the races is great as long as it's, you know, maintainable mm-hmm. over time. So mm-hmm. setting up the expectation, cause even if you're able to initiate change quickly, keeping that change three weeks in, three months in, three years in, that's what we're really looking to create. So Mm -hmm. the universal suggestion I have given to my clients historically, and I give essentially to anyone out there looking to create change, almost set the bar laughable, almost set it and don't then resist the urge to diminish or invalidate that small promise that you kept to yourself or the one small thing you did now tomorrow do one small thing tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day until that gets some traction and then do another small thing or do that one small thing for a little bit longer mm-hmm. because we're really looking to maintain these habits. We're looking yeah. for that lifestyle change. And what I've come to observe in myself and others, sometimes too much, too quick, because change already stresses our brain, creates overwhelm to even begin. So before mm-hmm. we get started, I work with a lot of clients in my membership too, who a five item to do list is, is so looming is so overwhelming that I'm not even going to do one. I'm mm-hmm. going to say F it and do one. Right. So not only does it make the first initiation of something new, a little bit more approachable, but then it becomes a bit more maintainable over time. But that might mean to wrap this all back together that we're sitting in discomfort for a little longer than we'd like. Mm-hmm. Not always a bad thing because we're allowing maybe these age old emotions that have been stored or, 
you know, maybe we're letting some stuff up and out that could only allow us to evolve even further into the physical and mental wellness in the future. Mm -hmm. Man, you said so many amazing things. And, you know, I think uh, something I've reflected on is how I really feel like a lot of uh, our sense of suffering kind of comes from when we are resisting, right? When I think we need to surrender a little bit more and we need to get uncomfortable, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? You know, we live in this instant gratification. You can have whatever you want right now. You can order something on Amazon and it'll be here in two minutes. They're out front actually. From a drone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A drone, it will fly in your window here in three minutes, you know, or put itself together and massage my back at the same time. <laughs> totally, totally. Or, you know, you have whatever, you know, disease thing wrong with you here, pop this bill, it'll all be fine. Like that's, that is the, the model of consumerism is you can have it all right now. And that's, I think that's something that's always drawn me to health. Even when I was a kid, uh, you know, it was as early as like fifth grade that I became aware of, like, I cared more about nutrition and exercise and, uh, cause you know, I saw, you know, and that's where we could get into a whole neurochemistry thing too, of kind of the dopamine reward network versus serotonin and delayed gratification and kind of everything in between. Uh, and it's like, well, yeah, like the, the most satisfying gratification is delayed. You've got to earn it. And, and health is a very honest process. And so, you know, what you said is, um, you know, it comes down to that behavior modification and it, and to change our daily behaviors, uh, it, it is that consistent practice. Like my very first nutrition program I ever took was Precision Nutrition, and they're they're huge now. It's like the number one nutrition certification in the world. Uh, and their level two program that I did was uh, all psychology, and you know their whole thing, their whole model that has made you know their brand kind of the leaders of nutrition coaching. Um, is based on behavior modification with like one thing a week. Their whole thing is one thing a week. You focus on one and, you know, but then what I found over the years of consulting with so many people is sometimes it's hard because there's so many things that need to be changed. I mean, I think about some of my clients with their, their protocols of like, oh, you know, you've got mold toxicity and Hashimoto's and, you know, you don't work out and you're eating gluten all day and you don't sleep well and you've got the Wi-Fi router in your room. There's like eight things that like we need to change right now. And then you have to kind of start doing that coaching of like the, okay, well, there's the big kahuna versus the low hanging fruit. And that's, that's their terminology, not mine, but the point being like, okay, you reel in a big kahuna, it's very strenuous. It's a lot of work, but damn homie, you're about to eat real good for like a week. But, um, it's not always realistic to reel in that big kahuna. So sometimes if you're kind of tired, you might just need to pick a little low hanging fruit. Like, Hey, I don't need to change everything overnight. I need to, you know, create those consistent behaviors. So, um, and you know, but that's where it comes back to like, you need help. We all need help in that journey. You know, we can't do it alone. So we need the, the, you know, the tribe. We need that guidance from our spirit animal. Dr. Nicole, I think you might just be my spirit animal. Maybe that's what's going on here. But. Oh, stop. That's, <laughs> I appreciate you said, but in all seriousness, I agree with you with that. And I think this piece of flow going with it, accepting, if you want to use that word to describe it, you know, it's a balance, mm -hmm. right? It's a balance too with connecting with ourselves. As much as you'll yeah. hear I talk about, I, I use a term called mental resistance. So back when I was just offering change is hard. Mm -hmm. Our mind, our body are going to resist change because it desires the familiar, it desires what it is predictable, again, in an effort evolutionarily to keep us safe, right? So, so change is going to be hard. So while you'll always hear me say, empower yourself, go beyond your mind. If my mind's telling me all the reasons not to sit and meditate for five minutes, so get on that meditation cushion and do it anyway. You're empowering that consciousness. You'll also hear me always say, listen, and this is something that comes again with time, learn to differentiate whether it's my mental tantrum of resistance that does live in the body, you know, your body feels agitated and all that, or whether it's coming from that intuitive space. And if it's your body screaming or your emotional body screaming for you need to hit pause, homie, or, you know, lady, like stop it for a second. You're tired, mm -hmm. you know? So that I think is the real skill and the balance point. So to speak to your point about the low hanging fruit, learning to accept 
if today and tomorrow it's all about those low baby changes or no change at all because I am just fatigued and exhausted, then learning to sit in that choice because what happens then is we beat ourselves up Mm -hmm. for those choices as well. So it's a dance, I think is the way I'm describing it, you know, hearing myself talk of finding, you know, differentiating when is this my mind tantruming and this is the moment I should make the choice to get beyond that resistance and do the thing, whatever the thing might be anyway. And when is it coming from that deeper, more intuitively knowing place where I just need to hit the pause for my own physical, emotional, spiritual best interest, and then learning how to actually hit that pause in a way that actually allows our body in those moments to recalibrate. Because I know for me, once I learned to differentiate, I would have the mental dialogue, right? The morning I did not go to the gym, even though I hadn't been to the gym in enough days, you know, as of recent, I really should be at the gym. If my body was screaming out, I'm tired, I need to go to the gym. I could lay on that couch and beat myself up about not going to the gym and cause my body such a stress response that I might as well be at the gym stressing my body out. So I think it's finding differentiating between the mental resistance, the physical and spiritual, emotional body speaking, and then learning how to flow, you know, kind of in that flow state, allow yourself to be in the choice that you've made because our body wants as you and all of your listeners know, our body wants to return to that balance, that Mm -hmm. homeostasis. So we have to get out of our own way and let it. Absolutely. I like how you said that with a homeostasis and, and that's kind of the beautiful thing about the human organism is it is all specific adaptation to impose demand. It's, you know, that's personal training. 101 is like, what is fitness? It's specific adaptation to impose demand. You know, you stretch this, it gets better at being in that lengthened position. You, you flex this, it gets stronger, you know, um, And so I think if we kind of look at everything about the human organism, including our cellular and cellular health uh, through this lens of specific adaptation to imposed demand, and I think if we look at kind of the psychological, psycho-emotional, spiritual, self-healing journey, I think it really is perfect to kind of compare it to working out of like, well, yeah, you know, is that hard workout what your body really needs that day? You do have to distinguish. And that's that's the hard thing where you've got to be really in tune with your biofeedback and your body. Um, and that's something, you know, because, yeah, man, five years ago, I was that guy. Like, I never missed a workout. I kicked my own ass all the time. Uh, whereas, like, this year, I have worked out less this year than any other year for the past, like, 18 years. Um, but I feel much healthier and better than I ever really have. And it's because I am getting better at practicing that. Hmm, no, I think I need a, I think I need to rest today. I don't think that's what my body needs, but you also have to be brutally honest with yourself. Um, but I think if people approach the psychoemotional self healing journey and let me consistently practice these habits to change my behaviors, to change that neuroplasticity neural network. Um, but kind of doing it in a, so, well, you know, so this concept, I can't believe I haven't said this thus far, but like a huge part of, um, my mantra with like the holistic savage challenge and stuff is how, you know, when most people think about, I need to get healthy, I need to get in shape. They're like, yo, I need a gym membership. I need to start deprivational dieting and I need to start kicking my own ass in the gym. And the whole process is then being fueled out of this sense of self-loathing. You know, the, the whole process is motivated and fueled by I'm unhappy with self and I'm trying to do something about it. And so then I hurt myself more with hard exercise and deprivational dieting. And so I'm trying to kind of flip that whole paradigm around of like, all right, well, let's fuel the whole process out of unconditional self-love and loving yourself enough to do what's necessary to be your best, which means taking care of yourself and loving yourself, which doesn't mean counting the calories and trying to cut the calories down, which doesn't mean kicking your own ass in the gym. It's doing the right behaviors that are going to nourish your mind, body, and soul consistently. And and so that's where I think unconditional love is really its own practice. Would you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. And I want to introduce another concept because when you were talking earlier, about listening to self, something else. So back to that intuitive nature that I believe we all come here prepackaged with. As far as I say it, one of two things happens on our journey. We become disconnected from that intuition that we can't, it's speaking per se, but it's so muted. I lived this 
because I've lived a history of conditioned pattern yeah. of protection of dissociation meaning I spent very little time in my human body, in my human vessel. I was, you know, kind of somewhere protected off in my psyche because of a very emotionally overwhelming feeling childhood with limited emotional support. So my protection was, I call it my spaceship very endearingly. It's since been retired. Um, I used to go away, but I was very, I mean, you would, speaking to me, you would not really fully know. Maybe if you were attuned, you would not maybe feel my full physical presence, but I was very much existing in life very successfully even. So one of two things, we become disconnected like I had. So part of my initial part of my journey was reconnecting, coming back into my, my body, my human form, my emotional centers and or so disconnect and or distrustful. Hmm. So a lot of us, and this is a very deeper conversation that I won't go too into, but we, because of, again, conditions, circumstance, context in which we were born and experiences that we had endured as a, usually starting in childhood, right? accumulate over time, we become distrustful of ourself and our, of our intuition. Mm -hmm. So even if we hear it speaking, we don't trust mm -hmm. what it's saying. Um, so again, another part of the journey, I believe is, so this wraps in with self-love too. Mm -hmm. The term I use is self-betrayal that most of us have developed a conditioned pattern of self-betrayal for different reasons, because we've witnessed and been modeled acts of self-betrayal. So we just, you know, kind of very much model, you know, our mm -hmm. choices after that. Um, we, we develop a habit of self-betrayal after a history of intending to change and because very much right change is hard. Like I said earlier, we just don't, we don't maintain it. So I don't trust myself to make changes. Mm -hmm. We on the deepest level, this is where that intuitive piece comes in. We don't trust our deepest self again, because of very real circumstances that, you know, it happened where we were that intuitive being as a young child and those around us weren't allowing our reality to be acknowledged. So because mm. we're in a dependency state as children and we quite literally need the caregivers around us to take care of our physical body, mm -hmm. we have to assume their reality over ours. So the mm -hmm. more that happens, the more we, we feel our intuition may be speaking to us, but we don't trust what it's saying because we've de developed the habit of looking outside of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? For whatever it is, our perceptions to be validated, our experiences, et cetera. So the path, with my very long intro in, that concept of the small daily promises, keeping mm -hmm. them small and acknowledging ourselves when we keep them as small as they are, not invalidating or diminishing ourselves that we keep them. Mm -hmm. and collecting the accumulated evidence that might not come immediate, but that will come over time. The positive effects of those daily promises goes a really long way because what we're doing in that really small step. And I, 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 I highlight this to my the clients I was working with and the membership I will write, showing that alignment between I intended to do this and I did it today. The more we do that, the more I begin to trust myself, mm -hmm. the more I begin to be confident in myself, and then to speak to the language you're using, possibly the more I love myself mm -hmm. overall. And I believe that's that pathway back to that deepest sense of the intuition that I might've heard all along, but repairing, I think the damage points that a lot of us carried, allowing ourselves mm. to love as well. But also part of it is exploring mm -hmm. the of not worthy of not enough. I mean, this is, so prolific in those narratives. I, I call them narratives, right? That yeah. I'm filtering, right? If you want to go all the way back to the beginning, I'm viewing the world through a filter of I'm not enough. So all I'm going to see, Brennan, is all of the evidence of how not enough I am. And this, again, this belief of not enough, of not worthy, we all carry, I think most of us, at least some version of that was installed, if you will, in childhood, you know, mm -hmm. or early developmental periods. And now I carry that. I've applied that filter and now I am living a, a adulthood experience of not enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that also wraps into this idea of self-love because if, as you become self-aware is as you become self-observational of those filters, if you begin to see that filter being applied of not enough, you know, it's going to be really hard to come to love yourself. To internalize mm -hmm. belief that not only are you more than enough, as I believe all of us humans are, but you're someone worthy of love. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us are applying a filter that's saying the complete opposite. And because 
we have that part of our brain, the reticular activating system that quite literally filters out our world in favor of confirmation. Before we know it, our world looks like exactly as we believe it to look. That's mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. That's people are like, well, I don't get it. I keep having these experiences that are just evidence of how not enough I am. They're not wrong. Mm -hmm. It's true. That's not going to get you on that path of shifting that field toward, toward one of allowing just as much in that same moment evidence of how enough and how worthy of love you mm -hmm. are in. I'm really glad you said all that because that is such an integral concept that's almost like the foundation of everything we're building throughout this conversation and um you know the self-betrayal and um kind of self-questioning uh very real thing you know and it gets back to that yeah what are the narratives or what's the story that you're telling yourself and um you're so right and that's what makes reality and interpreting reality and experiencing life and reality as we think we know it or we subconsciously choose to believe that we're not fully aware of you know it just like it gets really trippy really fast and so it's one of those like okay well what is the story i'm telling myself of what this all is um what do i want that to look like because to your point the the confirmation bias ph phenomena of uh yeah you're gonna see what you're looking for period you know so then what are you looking for and I think, um, I think we are all, uh, very intuitive beings and, and I, I'm glad to see like intuition is making a comeback and kind of a part of this whole awakening <laughs> thing. <laughs> I like it, you know, where did it go? It, you know, I, intuition has always been here. I just feel like we're just now kind of starting to be like, oh yeah, that intuition thing that we like all feel, uh, maybe we should listen to that more. Uh, because it's not usually wrong, but it does, you know, and, and that's where like Brene Brown obviously is doing so much amazing work with vulnerability and showing up and shame and guilt and all these things, because, you know, she has that very famous quote that I just love where it's, you know, like when you kind of fearlessly, uh, cultivate your own, you know, light and love, you're indirectly giving permission for others to do the same. I don't know, something to that effect, but um, it is one of those like, okay, let me dig inwards to, uh, you know, let me find that, that child and in, in something of, you know, what traumatic events caused you to feel like you were not worthy, you know, cause I, I think by nature you look at baby development, which I can say I've experienced, uh, you know, to some degree. Um, and you look at, as a child goes from baby to, you know, toddler and so on and so forth. And you watch the, the psychological development, you see when the ego starts developing, you see when all these different psychological traits and it's like, by nature, we think we're pretty awesome. And we're just like, yeah, like, this is great. We're awesome. So somewhere, so then if, if we don't carry that all the way in adulthood, it's like somewhere along the line, there was trauma that made you believe that you were not worthy enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we've got to reverse engineer yeah. that, right? Yeah. I kind of like expand on that too, because I think an important component of that is cognitively. Yeah. On Earth until seven, eight, nine, somewhere around there, depending on who you read, our our mental faculties are what is called egocentric. Yeah. Meaning we we do not have the ability to step outside of a self based assessment of what's happening in life. So, simple example, right? Someone, dad comes home after a stressed out day at work and is short or yelling at you, little Johnny, right? Little Johnny is going to assume that dad is, or just yelling around little Johnny, maybe not even directly at little Johnny, right? Mm -hmm. Because little Johnny does not, this is cognitive, cannot step back and understand other co-variables, if you mm -hmm. will, in scientific language of why dad might be yelling. It might not even be at Johnny. Like I said, that just might be short with everyone. Little Johnny is an egocentric mental state, which means mm -hmm. little Johnny thinks that it's little Johnny's fault. So mm -hmm. dad is mad at me is a really simplified version of what little Johnny will repeat in his mind. So part of that, how we erode that self-love and that very, which I agree with you. I think we all really do come prepackaged with love and gratitude and appreciation for who we are as a person. But because cognitively we do not get until we're in adolescence and 
and you know adulthood even when we can understand dynamics and work and stress and why dad might come home upset and it might not have anything to do with me right the more consistently those things happen divorce is a really big one when mm-hmm. there are adults even that are you know have had caregivers divorce at that age period there's a recess of their mind that believes that they were a cause of their even if nothing was directly you know said that they were part of the reason, if not the reason why mom and dad are no longer together. So Mm -hmm. that's real. And I point that out a lot um, because the more that happens, the more consistently then that is offered to us in our world, the more we solidify that into a belief. So now we become an adult that unless we're conscious and shift out of that, I call it depersonalizing. We tend to either have that core belief that I'm not worthy or I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, I'm not worth sticking around for, we carry that into our relationships. We also tend to, especially when our egos are being triggered, exist in that very egocentric state where Mm -hmm. we see, you know, your shortness on text as having to do with me, unless Mm -hmm. we step outside of our emotional reaction, right? And say, okay, well, maybe, you know, why, why is Janet short? Maybe Mm -hmm. Janet has something going on in Janet's life that has nothing to do with me. Yeah, maybe she could have talked to me differently, but she didn't, right? So I think that's a really, but I I highlight that because when those traumas, big T, little t happen at those developmental periods, we have no ability to see any other reality than it was us. And that I believe is where we begin to foster that belief that we're less than. Mm-hmm. Not totally. Whatever. And, you know, um, David Goggins uh, is a very interesting fellow. And, um, you know, since, since I joined the Navy after high school for the SEAL program, I'm pretty, you know, familiar with a lot of the, you know, big name SEAL dudes and, and Goggins, super fascinating dude, you know, Joe Rogan podcast and his book and all, you can't hurt me and all that. And taught just amazing human, amazing story. Um, and I like what he says in regards to uh, just kind of the, the, for lack of a better word, mind fuck that is coming into the world in reality. Cause none of us have any psychological train. You know, he, he takes it maybe a little bit extreme shall we say with like um you know because he's all about training the mind to be as tough as you know you know seal training on the body and you know he he kind of describes life as psychological warfare that we have zero training to be prepared for when we come into this world now you know is that questionably cynical or harsh or eh, i mean the dude's a soldier so it is what it is um, but nonetheless, it, like there is some, some truth that kind of resonates from that of kind of this psychological battle that is coming into the world and is coming into adulthood and navigating our reality and life and world around us that we don't have any preparation or, uh, training for. And so, um, yeah, I think it's kind of really interesting. I just, I love how you're able to break down what is a lot of complexity and a lot of stuff swirling around in our head. And you're so effectively able to break down like, okay, well, here's what's happening. I love what you said about the egocentric child of they don't know how to not be that. And that's where, um, you know, it made me think of the four agreements again, because uh, you know, what are the four agreements? Like always be impeccable with your word, you know, like speak your truth and don't do anything that's out of alignment with that and project that out there. Uh, Don't make assumptions, right? You know, what people are projecting onto you has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. Uh, Don't take things personally, because again, it has nothing to do with you and always do your best. And it's like, damn, homie, I think if we can live by those four things, we're doing all right. Yeah, Yeah, I could could not agree more. And I think I, I am, the way my brain has always worked, which is why I think I've been so successful in school in the scholastic institutions that I've been a whole hell of a lot in. Um, but I think it's also helping me now. I call it my gift in a sense because I'm very grateful that I've been able to see those bigger patterns and I think break them down for my own. That's how I understand mm-hmm. first mm-hmm. and foremost. Um, and then when I offer that out, I think it's it's incredible. So I think I know, put it this way, all of our brains work differently. We're different learners. We 
we do different things to teach ourselves and then to teach others. And I think one of one of the gifts that I can acknowledge, even though it's been hard, it's hard for me. And that little girl in me doesn't like to actually be seen, even though she desperately wants to. So even me saying this to you right now and acknowledging that, you know, that's a gift of mine. And I, there's a little bit of discomfort coming out. Like, oh, yeah. should I say this? Maybe I shouldn't be, you know, acknowledging, but actually in my future self journal every morning, Brendan, I've been working on seeing myself because that's that's part of my feeling. That's what I'm at right now. So I say that to say that uh, I, I think I've been gifted or, or the way my brain works in that way helps me understand. And then when I put that out in the world, again, I think that helps others understand these big concepts in mm -hmm. a way that is applicable. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I, I love that you admitted that, you know, and um, you know, hashtag vulnerability and, and all of that, but that's part of it, you know, being brave, showing up, uh, you know, cultivating that inner soul stuff and inner soul flame and, you know, turning yourself into a existential spiritual lighthouse that helps all the lost ships at sea navigate the treacherous waters that is our, you know, we could do, we could get real flowery real quick with that, but, yeah. um, you know, it's more of a kind of like namaste honoring the the light that uh, I see in you and you're choosing to share. You know, I'm, I always like to block off two hours for these podcasts, but this is, this is officially the longest recording we've had yet. You know, our very first episode was with one of my Reiki friends and it was about an hour and a half, but um, I don't want to take up your whole day, but Nicole, I just, I've been so looking forward to this conversation all year. Uh, we covered so much ground on so many amazing things and just more than anything, I have just the utmost uh, respect and love for you and all the work that you're doing. And I cannot wait for us to actually meet and hang out in person. So we'll have yeah. to make that happen in 2020. Absolutely. For sure. Same. And Brendan, same to you. I mean, when you said introing, I think our time together today that we've been walking a similar path. I do feel like we're kindred soul spirits and mm -hmm. what you are doing is incredible and I'm fully in support. It's truly been an honor just to have you cross my path, but to remain interconnected. And I know we're going to have those tacos actually in the flesh in person yes. one day so soon. Um, and I cannot wait for that, but I'm just eternally grateful for you yeah. and everyone else that supported me, but you so much light in the world and what you're doing for the functional medicine world is necessary and i am always in the full support of that you know well it, it's going to take all of it and it's going to take all of us you know so that's where i look at as like hey let's continue walking this this parallel journey and uh you know using our energy together to, to do something amazing you know and, and really share some light and love with the world so i'll let you go about the rest of your day such an honor i'll let you know when we have the yes. recording ready to rock and all of that. But thank you again. And uh, I'll look forward to talking to you soon, my friend. It's my pleasure. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful day.